Okay, so we are going to record this. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for registering and attending our wellness webinar. Our topic today is pre-diabetes. And we have a couple of housekeeping rules just before we begin. As a lot of you probably recognize as you're coming in and joining the webinar, you are automatically muted and your cameras are turned off. We do have some time at the end of our webinar where we will be able to open up the lines for any Q&A. We just realized also we have a chat feature. So if along the slides, if something kind of strikes you that's relevant that you want to share with us, if you don't want to hold off until Q&A, you can put that in the chat feature and we'll be sure to address that later on as well. We also do have some polls that we're going to launch during the webinar as far as feedback uh, from you is concerned. And we uh, are also at the end of this too, which will remind everybody as well. So whether you're coming here and joining us live or you've registered officially, you will receive a link to the recording here along with some other things as well. We have a post webinar survey that we'd love for you to fill out when all is said and done. And so we will, on that note, we'll begin our webinar. So again, thank you so much for coming. Our topic today is pre-diabetes. So this is very important for anybody who might be diagnosed with or at risk for developing type two. So we'll share with you what the risk factors are and steps for prevention as well. So just to give you a little bit of insight as to who I am, for those of you who might not know me yet, my name is Dina D'Alessandro. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist based out of New York City. And I'm also an adjunct lecturer at one of the City University Schools, CUNY Lehman College up in the Bronx in New York. Um, what I do in my own practice and my own services are quite a lot of different things. So for anybody who is familiar with what a dietitian does, we do a lot of things as far as nutrition education, much like this, this would be considered a community nutrition education event. I do try to partner and collaborate also with other healthcare providers, both in the virtual space and also in my neighborhood. As I mentioned, I live in New York City. I'm down on the Lower East Side, East Village of Manhattan. So I try to establish myself as like the neighborhood nutritionist there. I also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one individual and also group counseling for people who are recently diagnosed with chronic conditions or for anybody who's just looking to get a kickstart in developing healthful eating habits or if they are at risk for chronic diseases and they're learning they want to learn a little bit more about preventing that from happening for those of you who all already know me, you know that I love doing social media stuff. So we sometimes put together things like Instagram lives or Instagram Q and A's on Wellness Wednesdays on my Instagram platform. I have a YouTube channel where I have a lot of free content there as well. And you can pretty much find me all over the internet as Dish with Dina. And then on a more national or global perspective, I really do like to get involved in, in advocating for sustainable food and nutrition programs and policies and for food access and security to make sure that people who need the nutritious food and prevention and programs and anything that they need to do as far as health access is concerned is available to them. So that's a long time coming, but I really do like to get involved in a lot of those things as well. So I'm going to hand this off to my co-presenter, Pessy, who will introduce herself as well. Thank you, Dina, for that introduction and for this opportunity. Dina has been so kind as to take me on as an intern, and I'm learning so much from her. So a little bit about me. My name is Pessy. I'm a graduate of Brooklyn College, and right now I'm completing an internship in order to become a registered dietitian. Diabetes is a topic that's very personal to me, as I had gestational diabetes with my last pregnancy. With that diagnosis, I needed to prick my finger to test my blood sugar, and I had to do that several times a day. But once I saw a registered dietitian and made the changes she recommended, I was able to see the immediate impact that my diet had on my health. Right away, I had more energy, and by making the changes she recommended, I was able to make sure that my baby was healthy as well. Diabetes runs in my family. My brother was recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and both my parents have type 2 diabetes. So I see what they need to do in order to control it, and that makes me want to pursue a career in diabetes education so I might empower others to take control of their health in ways that are really easy to implement, like making food choices that will help control blood sugar, and by doing exercises or movements that could be helpful and at the same time enjoyable. 
So thank you all for joining us today to learn more about prediabetes and diabetes prevention. The objectives and takeaways of our webinar today is for you to learn about the risk factors of developing prediabetes, understand the cause of prediabetes, what happens in the body that results in this condition, learn about the tests that are used to diagnose diabetes, and we'll talk about blood sugar ranges in healthy individuals versus people at risk or with diabetes. And lastly, we want you to understand how to prevent diabetes and reverse prediabetes. There are four points, and we'll get into more detail about these, and they are nutrition, making healthy food choices, learning about proper portion sizes, maintaining a healthy body weight, and we'll talk about physical activity recommendations and benefits, and getting the necessary support and resources. So we're gonna go into more details about all these points, but first we have some questions to learn more about all of you. And I'm gonna hand this off to Dina. She's gonna launch a poll. Yes, I'm going to uh, try to get this to launch here. Let's see if this goes up there. So right now, everybody should see, this is an anonymous poll, just to get some idea as to who's actually joining us right now. We have a few questions on here that you can feel free to answer. Again, it is anonymous. We're looking just to understand a little bit more about your age range, when your last physical exam was, because we do talk a little bit about health screenings and doctor's visits in our discussion today. We also would like to learn if you have a history, either yourself or your family of pre-diabetes and diabetes. And again, the reason why this is anonymous is because that is considered private health information, but it does help us understand a little bit as to who our target audience is. And we also want to get a little bit more of an understanding of physical activity. Um, we've come to understand, especially in the case of the last year with the pandemic, a lot of people have either been very sedentary or have been moving around like they've never before. So we want to get an idea of what that means to you as far as physical activity movement is concerned. Concern. So I'll let this go for another few minutes, uh, maybe another handful of seconds here, because it does look like everybody is chiming in. So thank you for answering these questions. And this gives us a good idea as to who, who's watching this and who's, uh, you know, what your background might be in this and how we can even cater different and future events to more specific audiences in this. So thank you very much for an answering. So, so far, it looks like about 84% of you have voted. So I'll let this go on for another 10 seconds or so if everybody can chime in, if you don't mind answering the questions, not mandatory, just to get some feedback. Okay, thank you everybody. So I'm gonna end the poll now and we can maybe see on, I think we can see this on screen. I'm gonna share the results of this. So we do see that we have a nice split that we have about 26 to 60 year old watching here. This is nice adult section of life cycles are concerned. And we have last physical exam less than one year ago. Okay, so that maybe encourages a lot of you to get out there and make your yearly appointment as soon as you can. This is interesting too, to find out that a lot of you do have a history of prediabetes or diabetes. So hopefully what we're sharing with you today will resonate resonate with you. And oh, that's good. So 45% of everybody who's tuning in today does move around in minutes around 120 to 150 minutes per week. So that's fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that for now. And Pessy, I'm going to hand this back over to you because I believe you have the next set of slides there. Thank you, Dina. So prediabetes is a serious health condition where blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not high enough yet to be diagnosed as type two diabetes. The diagnosis of prediabetes is a concerning warning sign. It puts one at increased risk of developing type two diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. More than a third of Americans have prediabetes and of those people, more than 84% of them are not aware of their condition and this may be because there are no clear symptoms of prediabetes. Without getting tested, one would be unaware, and that is why it is so important to go for yearly screenings. We're gonna talk more about the tests used to diagnose soon. So it's important to talk to your doctor about getting your blood sugar tested if you have any of the risk factors for prediabetes. These include being overweight, which is defined as a BMI, a body mass index of 25 or greater, there are BMI calculators you may use online to figure out what your BMI is. 
but that doesn't tell the whole story. BMI is an indirect measure of body fat based on only height and weight, and it doesn't take into account many factors like frame size. So if you have a BMI of 25 to 29, but it feels right for you, that risk factor alone may not be cause for alarm. Age is a risk factor in developing diabetes. 26.8% of Americans age 65 and older have diabetes. So that's one in four older Americans or 14.3 million seniors. And that's both diagnosed and undiagnosed. And then 17.5% of Americans age 45 to 64 also have diabetes diagnosed and undiagnosed. Your genes will tell you if you're at a greater risk of developing diabetes. So having a parent, brother, or sister with type 2 diabetes increases your risk. I spoke about how I have three immediate family members with diabetes, both my parents and my brother. So I am at a higher risk of developing diabetes because of that. Lifestyle plays a part in your risk for developing diabetes. And this is one of the risk factors we have control over. Being physically active less than three times a week increases your risk, but the opposite is also true. By being active more frequently, you can lower your risk of developing diabetes. So we have some control and our fate is not entirely determined by our genes. If, if you ever had gestational diabetes, diabetes during pregnancy, or have given birth to a baby who weighed more than nine pounds, you're at a higher risk of developing diabetes. And again, that's another risk factor that I personally have. Having PCOS is a risk factor. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome tend to have higher levels of inflammation and insulin resistance, which puts them at risk of developing diabetes. Race and ethnicity, much like our genes, can also put one at increased risk of developing diabetes. African Americans, Hispanic Latino Americans, Asian Americans, American Indians, and Pacific Islanders are at a higher risk. Many of these risk factors are out of our control, but our weight, our food choices, and the amount of time we spend being active are things we can make changes to in order to lower our risk. So what is happening inside of the body that causes prediabetes and then diabetes? When we eat carbohydrates like bread, oats, pasta, or fruits, the body breaks them down into glucose. That glucose passes from the digestive system into the bloodstream where it can be circulated around the body to each and every one of our cells to be used for energy. And now this is where insulin comes into play. Insulin is a hormone made by our pancreas. The pancreas releases insulin into the bloodstream. And that insulin is what helps move glucose from the bloodstream into our cells so they have the energy that they need. In cases of prediabetes, the cells are not responding as they would normally respond to insulin and they do not take in glucose from the blood. And this is called insulin resistance. The cells can't get the energy they need from glucose that's right there in the bloodstream. Blood glucose levels begin to rise. There's no way for the glucose to go from the bloodstream into the cell and we have what's called hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. So now there's insulin resistance, there's high blood sugar. The pancreas makes even more insulin to try to get cells to respond and take in that glucose that's sitting in the bloodstream. So the cells could use it for energy. Eventually what happens is the pancreas can't keep up and blood sugar levels remain high, resulting in prediabetes. And eventually this leads to type two diabetes where blood glucose levels are even higher. And at the point of type two diabetes, you've progressed into another condition where you have problems with insulin production. The overworked pancreas shuts down. It stops producing that insulin. Type two diabetes requires medications and possibly insulin injections to keep blood sugar levels under control. And with type two diabetes, unlike with prediabetes, you start seeing symptoms. And these include hyperglycemia, of course, the high blood sugar levels. There's fatigue because the cells are not getting the energy they need. There's excessive thirst and frequent urination. The kidneys are working in overdrive, trying to get rid of the extra glucose from the blood and they get rid of fluids along with it. So if you're getting up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom a number of times, that may be a sign of diabetes. 
And type 2 diabetes is associated with long-term damage. There's a risk of organ failure, especially the eyes, the kidneys, the nerves, and the heart. So in order to find out for sure if you have prediabetes or diabetes, you would need to get your blood tested so that blood glucose levels could be measured. Testing is simple and results are usually available quickly. Your doctor will take one or more of the following blood tests to confirm the diagnosis. First is the hemoglobin A1C test, and this measures your average blood sugar level over the past two or three months. So it gives you the best indication of what's been going on in your body. An A1C below 5.7% is normal. Between 5.7 and 6.4% indicates prediabetes, and 6.5% or higher indicates diabetes. Next is the fasting blood sugar test. This measures blood sugar after an overnight fast, which means no eating from the time you went to bed the night before. A fasting blood sugar level of 99 milligrams per deciliter or lower is normal. 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter indicates prediabetes, and 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher indicates diabetes. So under 100 is healthy. It's the one test you want to get below 100 on. And last, we have the glucose tolerance test. This is commonly used during pregnancy and it's usually administered around weeks 24 to 28. This test measures your blood sugar level before and after you drink a sugary drink. This is a liquid that contains glucose. You'll fast, so no eating overnight before the test and have your blood drawn the next morning to determine your fasting blood sugar level. And then you drink the glucose drink and have your blood sugar level checked an hour later, two hours later, and possibly three hours after drinking. And after two hours, a blood sugar level of 140 milligrams per deciliter or lower is considered normal. And this is a jump up from the under 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is considered normal after an overnight fast, because after eating or drinking, we expect blood sugar levels to rise a bit. And 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter indicates prediabetes, and 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher indicates diabetes. And now for the good news, if you have prediabetes, you can absolutely lower your risk for developing type 2 diabetes, and you may even be able to reverse the diagnosis of prediabetes. In no other disease does lifestyle play a more important role in prevention and treatment than in diabetes. And we're gonna go into further detail about these four points, which all play an important factor in preventing and reversing prediabetes and diabetes. And these are making healthy and appropriate food choices, maintaining a healthy weight and getting regular physical activities. These can all help lower blood glucose levels. And also important is getting support to manage your stress and to stay motivated to manage your condition. Now I'm gonna pass this over to Dina as we go into more detail. Thank you, Pessy. So we're going to start talking about the, uh, the definition of what macronutrients are and getting into how to make healthy food choices. All three macronutrients that you see listed here, those are carbohydrates, proteins and fats are necessary for your bodily functions and your overall health. And they all provide us with calories or energy, but we want to test your knowledge first. So I'm going to launch another poll to get a better idea of what you may already know or don't know. And then you can confirm your answers in the coming slides. So let me pull up again here on screen, another poll. And this is also anonymous, so you can test your, your knowledge anonymously, where we're going to ask you if you're taking into account your meal planning, the variety of foods that are on a plate at any given time, what percentage of your plate should be filled with what are called non-starchy vegetables, and you have a variety of answers there. You can also answer what percentage of grains that you eat over the course of the day should be considered whole grains. So if you don't mind voting on that too. And then we are also asking about the benefits in eating fiber rich foods. You can select all that you uh, that apply here in the multiple choice question, whether it keeps you full, controls your blood sugar, etc. We're also asking you which of the following are examples of what are called lean proteins. Again, you can select, select all that apply here. And which of the following are examples of unsaturated fats? So maybe you've heard that term before or not. And I see everybody 
is voting and getting their polls in there, test your knowledge. I know and recognize a lot of you, so I would be very surprised if you didn't get some of these answers correct. So we'll give you about another 30 seconds or so if anybody else would like to chime in. I think there's about 15% so far who voted or who are taking the, the poll, the knowledge on macronutrients test, your pretest on here. Excellent, okay, let's take a look. Another 10 seconds, about half of you have voted so far. Again, this is anonymous and not mandatory. Um, you don't get any gold stars except for the gift of knowledge if you are getting any of these correct. And again, we'll go over the answers to all of these in the slides to come. Okay, thank you for everybody who voted. I'm gonna end the poll now and I will share the results on screen. So let's take a look. Percentage of your plate should be filled with non-starchy vegetables. Most of, most of you said 50%. We'll see if that is correct. Whole grains should consist about 50% of your overall grain consumption. We'll also confirm that in the slides to come. All of the above as far as benefits and eating fiber rich foods. And then all of the above as far as lean proteins and uh, unsaturated fats. We have a variety of different choices here as well. Okay, so we will see if you were right or if you were wrong on the following slides. So I'll stop that right now and I'll go into our discussion about macronutrients. So yes, you know, when it comes to this diagnosis of pre-diabetes, diabetes, anything related to blood sugar, we are definitely going to be focusing on how to better manage your carbohydrate intake. But I do want to just disclaim that we do not want to vilify any food. We are very careful in the dietetics profession these days uh, to not label foods as good or bad. We want to make sure that you feel free with any of your food choices, but I do want to focus more on a candid conversation regarding carbohydrates. And I also want to acknowledge if anything, uh, if your family is anything like mine, cultural and traditional meals just normally tend to be very carb dense or, or starch heavy. And that can be really challenging if you're trying to manage or reduce your risk of this particular condition. We've also seen a lot of uh, catchphrases and keywords coming up in the last handful of years, things like low carb diets or carb free diets or things that might be also categorized under the ketogenic diet. These are trending. However, as far as our research is concerned, we do have recommendations that state about 45 to 65% of your overall daily calories should come from carbohydrates. So when you have a particular blood sugar related condition like prediabetes or diabetes type two, then, you know, skewing that on the lower end of side of that range would be a little bit more of what we would recommend, but we don't necessarily want you to completely avoid all carbohydrates because carbs are your body's main source of energy. They really do help you fuel your brain, your kidney, your heart, your muscles, and your central nervous system. And carbs are literally in everything, every Thing you can possibly imagine both in the plant-based world and in some of the animal-based world here, aside from say muscle meats, carbs are in everything. All plant foods have carbohydrates, milk and dairy products do as well in the form of what's called lactose or a milk sugar. And some of the sources where you'll find carbohydrates residing are things like whole grains, things like breads, cereals, grains, pastas, rice, even popcorn, starchy vegetables, which we mentioned in our poll, just to distinguish what that means. Starchy vegetables are things like corn, peas, beans and lentils, parsnips, plantains and potatoes. And then non-starchy vegetables are things like asparagus, dark leafy greens, broccoli, mushrooms, tomatoes, and so on. So there are varying amounts of fiber in those categories of food that do help you feel full, but also slow the absorption of sugar, which help to improve your overall blood sugar levels. Milk and yogurt listed here too. Um, sometimes you might get the recommendation of 
of aiming for a low fat or a non-fat dairy product, something lower in saturated fats. Depending on what your current struggles are, if you have high cholesterol issues, we could see that recommendation being relevant. But I do often encourage people just to be savvy with reading the back of the food product and making sure that the label does not have added sugars because sometimes when the manufacturers take out the fat, they add in some extra sugar. And you'll see that either in the form of actual sugar or if it says it's a flavored product, like a fruit on the bottom type of thing, there might be some syrup or other kinds of um, sugary uh, additions added to that food product. And of course, last but not least, we're not denying sweets. So anything in that sweets, sweetened foods and sweetened beverages would also be considered a sugar. And these are usually uh, related to table sugar or what is known as sucrose. And that is the simple form of all carbohydrates also used in our body as energy. And we'll go a little bit more into detail that in the slides to come. So on our end here, when we're educating our clients and our patients about how we can better manage our carbohydrate intake, we sometimes use what's called the glycemic index, which is a, an imperfect but useful tool. And it's based on a relative ranking of how carbohydrates in foods are in according to how they affect, affect your blood glucose level. So these could be either naturally occurring sugars or added sugars to your food that will either spike very quickly or not as quickly your blood sugar. And of course, you know, it's really more about, which Pessy will go into a little bit later as far as meal planning. It's really about how these things are adding up over the course of your day, your week, and what the pattern is that you're doing. We try to say not, you know, one meal is not going to make or break you, but we do try to look at patterns and consistency um, in as far as managing your overall condition. So carbohydrates that are listed as a low glycemic index value, and this is on a scale of one to 100. So anything that's on the list of about 55 or less would be more of those complex carbohydrates. These are going to be more fibrous, more slowly digested and absorbed and metabolized and will ca cause a lower rise in your blood glucose. Carbohydrates that are whole grains, higher in fiber, have lower glycemic index and a better effect on blood sugar levels are actually associated with a decreased risk of diabetes. And examples of that would be things like quinoa, barley, sweet potatoes, and fruits that have an edible skin, because that edible skin also adds to the fiber factor. Simple carbohydrates, refined types of sugars, those would be on the higher end of the glycemic index. Those are things like white breads, sugar sweetened beverages, pretzels and chips, pastries, all the fun stuff, right? Pastries, alcohol, and even some tropical fruits. So if we're taking away that peel, just by nature, some of those tropical fruits might also have a higher glycemic index and can quickly raise the blood sugar level. So again, the higher consumption, the pattern of this happening over the course of your meal, your day, your week can be associated with the development of type two diabetes as well. So now let's talk a little bit about serving sizes. Again, trying to manage the portions of what you're eating over the course of the day, and we will define some of this as well. So serving sizes are important in order to ensure that we're eating enough carbohydrates to give us that energy and allow our bodies to function appropriately, but not so much that it potentially could spike our blood glucose levels. So what you see here on the slide, the serving sizes are defined as volume or weight. So you have the amount of food that you're seeing in front of you, like a slice of bread, a cup of cereal. But when we talk to people about trying to manage their car carbohydrate intake, we sometimes recommend in gram form about a serving would be about 12 to 15 grams of carbohydrates would be considered a serving. So if we're designing a meal plan for someone, we would maybe have a varied of three to five carbohydrate servings per meal. And this would depend on your current weight, your physical activity level, and your overall current uh, blood glucose control, how managed it is. So for example, if you're eating uh, for dinner, you know, fish with a side of pasta and a bean salad, the fish would have no carbohydrates in them. A side of pasta in its serving size of about a, about a third of a cup here, that would be about 15 grams of carbs. So that's one serving of carbs. And then your bean salad, 
if it was a half a cup of beans or whatever, that would be about 15 grams of carbs too. So now you have two servings of carbohydrates in that meal, and that should be okay as far as not spiking your blood sugar. Another example for a great snack could be something like popcorn. So just plain air popped popcorn, about three cups. That's quite significant and generous in the serving size, but gram for gram, that still only gives you about 15 grams of carbs. So you're doing really well by having something filling that won't uh, affect your blood sugar in that way. So if you want to, uh, again, we, we do really recommend try not to obsess over weighing and measuring everything. We don't want to put you on the track in that respect, but it's sometimes nice to eyeball certain things. So we've given you some guidelines here as to what you can use in relationship to these serving sizes. So for instance, a slice of bread would be about the size of a CD. One cup of food would be about the size of a baseball. And as you can see here, so on and so on, tennis ball, an egg, and, and uh, in that respect. You can also, if you're like me, I don't play sports, so I don't know what a baseball looks like, but you can use your hand as a guide. And this is also relative to, depending on, a, on your own physical structure, your hand is going to be differently sized than someone else is. So you can use your hand as a guide in portioning things out where a clenched fist, an entire clenched fist would be about a cup. The front where your knuckles are located would be about a half a cup. Your thumb is about the same size of a tablespoon and so on. And by the way, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the other webinars we have in line coming up in the future, but this really does remind me of making sure that we're telling you to recognize your hunger and fullness cues. So keep an eye out for some future webinars where we will integrate into our discussion mindful eating habits so that you can utilize these, uh, these tools and these strategies as well as creating an individualized approach for yourself when it comes to eating. Next up here, the other macronutrient is protein. Again, this is going to give us calories and energy. It is very important as far as functioning, bodily functions for growth and muscle repair. So again, if you're undergoing uh, working out or you have uh, recovering from a surgery, it depends on what's going on in your life, how much protein you might need. But these are also known as the building blocks of amino acids. And just by nature, protein actually helps keep us fuller longer and stabilizes that blood glucose control. So the sources in which you can find protein are also available in plant and animal form. Things like fish and poultry, turkey, beans, legumes, dairy products like yogurt as well. And our protein needs, like I was saying before with the carbohydrates range, usually we expect about 10 to 35 percent of our overall daily intake in calories to come from protein. So again, that's a very large range depending on who you are and what your needs are. And as you can see here, you're aiming for about three ounces or what would be the size of a deck of cards or the inside of the palm of your hand. That's about a three ounce serving size of, of any kind of protein food. And then last on the macronutrients is our friend fats. Fats are an integral part of our diet as well. Here we have a little bit on the higher end recommendations for fats as far as daily caloric intake. We expect about 20 to 35% of calories to come from fat. So fat's not a bad thing. We also see that fat does tend to help us keep fuller longer, much like fiber and protein. But I do want to just put a little caveat in here that gram for gram, fats do bring about uh, a little bit more than twice as many calories to your table than protein and carbs do. So just be conscientious that you're not necessarily over snacking or overeating on fat foods or things that contain healthy fats because that can add up. We also encourage you to focus more on what's called the mono and the polyunsaturated fats, things like avocado, nuts, nut butters, olives, seeds, and fish are rich in these healthy fats and also rich in what are called omega-3 fatty acids. And unsaturated fats are shown to improve also a bonus cholesterol levels. So they help lower that lousy, that LDL cholesterol, and they increase that good stuff, the HDL cholesterol. They also help with lowering overall inflammation and reducing the risk of heart disease. And then when it comes to saturated fats, these are fats and oils that are usually solid at room temperature. Again, not necessarily necessarily off the table, but, you know, just being a little bit more mindful in portions. Those are things that can be found in uh, butter, cheese, and red meat. Pasty, I'm going to hand this off to you for the next set of slides.
Thank you, Dina. So we want to plan out our meals so we have the right foods available. It's so helpful not to have to think about what we'll be eating when we get hungry, to have it already planned out, or to be able to just grab something healthy that's already prepared. We want our meals to consist of a balance of all three macronutrients that Dina discussed, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. The plate method is a useful tool to use in order to incorporate recommended portion sizes and to ensure that you'll be getting a good balance of macronutrients. So the plate method recommends to aim for half of your plate to be filled with non-starchy vegetables. So good for everyone who got that right on the poll question. And aim for a quarter of your plate to be filled with carbohydrates from whole grains or from starchy vegetables and aim for a quarter of your plate to be filled with protein and aim to drink water or zero calorie drinks. And we wanna eat consistently throughout the day in order to keep blood sugar levels stable and to prevent spikes and crashes in our blood sugar levels. Balanced blood sugar helps keep our brain healthy because our brain relies on glucose for energy. This keeps our energy levels stable and our mood balanced. When sugar levels are not stable, we just don't feel well. And this can lead to increased sugar cravings, irritability, poor sleep, brain fog, anxiety, low energy, and weight gain. And in the longer term, unstable blood sugar levels may lead to the development of diabetes. So planning out meals will help keep our hunger and satiety in check. We wanna eat every few hours. We can estimate that we need 100 calories of energy for every hour that we are awake. And this diagram shows a meal schedule where someone's eating every few hours. So maybe they're having a small 200 calorie breakfast at nine and then another 200 calorie snack at 11 to carry them over until their lunch at one in the afternoon. So different times will work for different people depending on their lifestyle, of course. And take into, the, take into account the time you wake up and the time you go to sleep. And when we're the most active, we're going to need a bit more energy. Eating carbohydrates together with proteins and unsaturated fats will help lower their effect on blood sugar levels, like Dina spoke about before with the glycemic index. The protein and fat help prevent immediate absorption of glucose into the bloodstream. They prevent a sudden spike in blood sugar. So for example, you can pair popcorn, a whole grain that's high in carbohydrates with peanuts, which have protein and fat, and other examples of balanced snacks include yogurt with almonds, peppers and hummus, apple and peanut butter, whole grain crackers and cheese, or guacamole on whole grain chips. In, in this photo, you could see a Dish with Dina event where Dina helped people put together combinations that had a balance of macronutrients, carbs, protein, and fat. So moving on, what does it mean to maintain a healthy weight? A healthy weight is what is healthy for you. There are many factors, including culture and ethnicity. And as we mentioned before, body mass index doesn't tell the entire story. One of the factors that go into a healthy weight is being active. And Dina's gonna talk more about that in just a moment. Choosing nutrient dense foods that keep you full is important to maintaining a healthy weight. Nutrient-dense foods are foods that are rich in vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients like fiber, and they don't have too much saturated fat, added sugars, and sodium. So we're talking about fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish, lean meat, skinless poultry, peas, beans, nuts, and seeds. And we want to keep in mind portion sizes, of course. And sleep is actually very important in maintaining a healthy weight. We need around eight hours a night. And research done on adults shows that sleeping for only four hours a night compared to 10 hours a night appears to increase hunger and appetite, and in particular for foods that are high in carbs and high in calories. And this is because the body needs more energy. There are studies that show a link between less sleep and obesity, and this may be because the hormones that control hunger are affected by sleep. So we feel more hungry and the lack of sleep makes us feel tired and less likely to get as much physical activity. Stress plays a factor in maintaining a healthy weight. When you're under stress, you may find it harder to eat healthy. 
During times of particularly high stress, you may eat in an attempt to fulfill emotional needs, sometimes called stress eating or emotional eating. And you may be especially likely to eat high calorie foods during times of stress, even when you're not hungry, maybe chocolate, for example. So I'm gonna hand this over to Dina, who will launch another poll. <laughs> yes, we're always waiting to test everybody out. We have one last poll. It's only one question. And let's see if everybody here before I move on to the next slide, can you answer how much physical activity is recommended per week? Is it 60, 90, 120, or 150 minutes per week? What is your best guess if you don't already know that? And this is based on the US uh, DA and the uh, Dietary Guidelines for Americans in the US, which gets updated every five years. They have a special recommendation for physical activity, especially in the moderate intensity category, like something that's getting your heart rate up. What's the physical activity minutes per week that's recommended? I'll give you another maybe 15 seconds or so. About 71% of you have already voted on this. Okay, I see what's going on here. So far, it looks like some good guesses. We have a couple more seconds if you want to get your votes in. And I'm going to end the poll now and share on screen. So we will find out what the answer is coming soon. A lot of you said 120 minutes and a lot more of you said 150 minutes. So we will see if that is correct, which one of those is correct. All right, so engaging in regular physical activity, as Pessy mentioned, is very important. Another helpful factor to take into consideration when managing your overall health, especially with prediabetes and diabetes. I just want to disclaim this because uh, by law, it is outside of my scope of practice to really discuss physical activity other than just sharing with you the recommendations and the guidelines for Americans. So please, before you start any fitness routine or workout regimen, make sure that you do get clearance from your medical doctor doctor before doing that. We don't want any injury to happen there. So insulin sensitivity is increased because of this particular condition. So your muscle cells are better able to use, or I should say during physical activity, your insulin sensitivity is increased. So your muscles are open up and better able to utilize any of that available insulin, taking up glucose during and after activity. When your muscles contract during activity, your cells are able to open up and then it's used for energy and doesn't build up in your, in your bloodstream there, whether insulin is available or not. So it's really the gift that keeps on giving. You're working out and your body is getting used to that movement and it helps open up those cells for you. So regular physical activity can reduce your risk of developing type two diabetes and something what's called metabolic syndrome, which are a cluster. It's a cluster of uh, conditions and a combination of either having too much excess fat around the waist also having elevated blood pressure or high blood pressure and a decrease in those good, that high density lipoproteins, that HDL cholesterol, if you don't have enough of that too, that can be part of that complication for leading up to metabolic syndrome, as well as high triglycerides, which is somewhat cholesterol related, but also carbohydrate related and high blood sugar there too. So if you have a combination of those things, you're possibly headed in the direction of getting diagnosed for metabolic syndrome, but and uh, engaging in regular physical activity can help with reducing that as well. Regular physical activity can also help keep your thinking, learning, and judgment skills sharp. It can also reduce your risk of depression and anxiety and also help you sleep better. Exercise actually even helps maybe you fall asleep even more easily and it improves your overall sleep quality. It also helps reducing, uh, you know, short-term feelings of that anxiety too. People really do engage in this as a stress reducer and that can lead in that direction of what other habits are happening that are uh, affecting your overall nutrition habits too. So engaging in regular physical activity is really beneficial in that way. As far as the medical clinical approach, it also helps with lowering your blood pressure, improving your cholesterol levels and reducing your risk of heart disease and stroke. Being regularly, regularly active can help uh, lower your risk for also developing several commonly occurring cancers. So research does show that adults who participate in greater amounts of physical activity have reduced risk of developing cancers of the bladder, breast, colon, endometrium, esophagus, kidney, lung, and stomach. So quite, again, quite a benefit of this. Exercise also strengthens our bones and our muscles. Fun fact, as you age, your body starts just naturally deteriorating a little bit. You do lose muscle mass and bone density, but 
doing aerobic and muscle strengthening and bone strengthening physical activity, even at a moderate intensity level can slow the loss of that bone density that just naturally comes with age. And having, uh, I'm sorry, I should say the engaging in regular physical activity is one of those few lifestyle choices that can really have as large an impact on your overall health. Um, people who are physically active for 150 minutes, whoever got that right, 150 minutes a week, do have about a 33% lower risk of all core cause mortality than those who are physically inactive. And you do not have to do any kind of crazy high amounts of activity or what's called vigorous intensity activity to reduce your risk of premature death and other chronic conditions. Benefits really do start to accumulate with any amount of moderate or vigorous intensity activity. Um, so small, start small, increase gradually. If you've never worked out before, if it's been a while, you know, chip away at some things, both in increasing frequency, duration, and intensity as you go. So 30 minutes a day, five days a week of moderate physical activity like aerobic ex exercises or brisk walking or biking or swimming. In a moderate intensity, the way that you'll be able to understand where that's at, your heart rate is a little higher. So you're doing what's called a talk test. You can speak, you can kind of carry along a conversation, but you might not be able to carry a tune. Moderate to intensity to high intensity muscle strengthening as well. So something like resistance or weight bearing exercises, things like push-ups, sit-ups, and squats. Try to do those about two days a week if you can lead up in that direction too. And at the very least, if you have been somewhat sedentary, try to be less so, spend less time sitting, even light intensity activity, just getting up and moving around, taking a short walk around the block can definitely offset some of those risk factors of being sedentary. And you do gain even more benefits by being active the higher you go. So if you're aiming for 150 to 300 minutes per week, then you're gonna be spot on there. Also the proper amount of support. So whether it's an individualized approach or group sessions, you know, this can really help you with managing your stress and helping you uh, strengthen those habits, staying motivated, solving problems, anything that could potentially slow your progress or knock you off track in that way. Cause it can be quite challenging to keep this going very regularly. So try to get support from a variety of different people. Healthcare professionals, specialists like registered dietitians, they can really help you make realistic, long-lasting life changes. And again, like I said, even support groups, if you enjoy that camaraderie, people who are struggling with the similar conditions that you have, please be sure, especially for those who marked yourselves as less or I should say less than a year ago or more than a year ago before you've had your physical exam, try to maintain your regular screenings. And if it's not already, which I think it is, if it's not already part of your normal blood panel when you're getting your blood test done, ask for a hemo hemoglobin A1C test from your doctor. Uh, within your own community, you might have family members, friends, coworkers that are similarly health-minded. So you can also encourage and motivate each other and you can achieve, achieve your goals goals together in that way. And of course, we also have professional organizations, which I'll share a little bit in the um, next slides to come as to where to go if you really need some more guidance. So places like diabetes.org and other websites that we want to share with you there. So we are wrapping up our conversation, but before we go and before we open up the Q&A discussion, I wanted to share with you my contact info and not just mine. I do work with a team of interns like PESI and a variety of nutrition student volunteers who really helped me put all this stuff together. And in the case of today's webinar, I'm really giving a lot of uh, acknowledgement to PESI. So thank you, PESI, for that. We supplied you today with the what, what you need to know, but working with a dietitian or a specialist or a mental health professional really can help you with the how, because ultimately it's not just about the the food, it's about the behavior. So if you would like to work with me at some point in the future, you can schedule an initial consultation with me. We'll learn a little bit more about your needs and my services that I provide and how I could potentially help you with managing your condition or establishing some goals for yourself. And even if it's something just like getting you up and running with some healthy eating behaviors, you can always visit my website and click on the request appointment button which will bring you to my online scheduler and you can set up an appointment there. You can also 
watch out for things like we're putting together a lot of these things called 28 day programs. So we have monthly programs that kind of elaborate what you learned here. And we do have a variety of other uh, wellness topics that we're engaging in, which you can go a little bit deeper in if that's something that interests you. Those usually come with a, a private Facebook group and some group coaching content in there too. We also do a lot more of these things like wellness webinars uh, when it is safer to do this in person we could also do things like this on site, a workshop, any kind of health and wellness topics. Um, some of these things are for free, much like we offered today. And some of these things we do for cost. So if you work for a company or you think this is interesting, you want to share our information with other people. If you are a fitness instructor or you work for a doctor's office, we also love to engage and partner and collaborate with other healthcare professionals. So please keep us in mind if there's anything else that you're looking to elaborate on in the future. Um, and as a reminder, please keep an eye out after, not exactly immediately after today, but within the next day or so, you will get an email thanking you for coming to today's webinar, whether you were able to come live or you registered in advance, you'll get a link to the recording. You'll get an anonymous post-webinar survey. We really do appreciate any feedback that's given to help us improve on future content like this. And you will also come away with a free sample two-day meal plan that we put together for you. So here are some of the resources I mentioned before as to where you can go to to learn a little bit more about prediabetes and diabetes and general health information and wellness. Some of the stuff you might have heard of before, diabetes.org, the CDC, Mayo Clinic, obviously your physician or other healthcare professionals and talking to them about getting screenings or any brochures or information that they can give you. And yes, of course, you can always visit my website. We have a ton of free content on there. We have a lot of social media platforms that we like sharing information. And on that note, I will open up the forum. So for anybody who does have questions, comments, feedback for myself or for PESI, uh, feel free to, I guess you can use the little raise hand icon Icon, or you can throw in the chat box a question if you have anything, or you can open up and unmute yourself at this time if you're able to do that. And we'll stick around for another five minutes or so and answer any questions that you might have. Any takers? Let's see, I'm looking at the chat box. I don't see anything in there other than hello, hello, hello. And let's see, do anybody? Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Hema. Hema says great presentation. Thank you so much, Hema. I do want to see the gallery because I want to get an idea of who's on here. If anybody's raising their hand, I can't see anything. Oh, you guys, thanks so much for coming. I see a lot of familiar faces and names. Hi, Stanley. Hi, Danielle. Thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate this. Antoinette, thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, I'm glad. Oh, there we go. Stanley, go ahead. You have a question. Yes. Hi, hi, Dina. Thanks hi. for thanks for letting me in. Of and um, great presentation. I agree with everyone else. I think that was a lot of great information to share. Thank you. Um, so for everyone that's on the call, um, I'm I'm a mindfulness coach, so I mm -hmm. help people in the health, wellness, and fitness area as well. And that was definitely like a huge uh, learning experience for me to to just learn more about like nutrition and what it's all about and how it affects uh, your day to day life. Um, one question that I had was was more for uh, clients that I've worked with who struggle with uh, not necessarily that like the nutrition part, but like building the habit of like choosing the right nutrition or uh, making the right choice because we're so busy in our day to day life, whether it's work, mm -hmm. family, or anything else. Um, do you have like any recommendation or resources that we people can go to to? Uh, not necessarily like follow a specific diet plan, but more of helping them uh, understand what's what's a healthy uh, habit or way that would work for them specifically. You know, it's funny, whenever anybody asks questions for dietitians, it always feels like on our end, we start off with, it depends. <laughs> and it really, it really does depend because it's quite an individualized thing. Like you mentioned, if somebody is kind of on the go, you know, the mm -hmm. first thing that comes to mind is, well, let's grab something very quick and convenient, but quick and convenient doesn't have to mean unhealthy. If you take some of the guidelines that we're sharing today, or mm -hmm. if you learn a little bit more about what we call like macro combining, like making sure you have that well-rounded plate that if you are picking something up that might be high in carbs, but not as ratio wise, not as much 
fat and protein to it, then you might want to add on like an, you know, hard boiled egg or some nuts or something like that to kind of bump up that macro factor, just to make mm -hmm. sure that your blood sugar levels are staying kind of level. Um, so I mean, if there's anything specific, I can look more into actually sharing resources off the top of my head. I don't know if diabetes.org actually gives they might, they might give recommendations of like meal plannings or some kind of guidelines to that. Uh, because Stanley, as I'm sure, you know, if you just do Google on the internet, I don't trust a lot of <laughs> things that people find out there, but it does have to come to what your needs are. So if you're a very active right. person and you require more calories, but you know, you want to make it convenient for you, what's wrong with just opening up a can of beans and throwing them into, you know, a bowl and adding some other kinds of vegetables or protein or something like that. That's a quick not like no cook option in that case. Um, so I, I don't know if that's giving you any ideas or, you know, thoughts that are answering your question in that way. And I'll also open this up to Pessy too, if Pessy wants to chime in. Uh, but is that helpful just in the sense of really anything is, anything is okay to eat. It just mm -hmm. has to be what's right for you. And being savvy yes. with, you know, reading the labels, understanding what comes to things and making sure that if you are eating something that is a little bit more high in carbohydrates, that it's not high in like added sugars and it's not a simple type of carb. Um, and on the same respect, you know, grab and go options that might be very high in fat or high in salt aren't really going to do you very many favors either if you're dealing with health complications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Pessy, I don't know. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but is there anything online stuff that we have? I mean, I'm pitching my own thing. You can go watch my video series on gaining kitchen confidence and learn how to do a meal plan for yourself if you want to. But that's oh, there you go. That's, that's, an, that's, not a that's bad about idea. an hour, an hour <laughs> investment of your time, but it's free online. Yeah. Where you learn about like shopping from your own kitchen and creating shopping lists for yourself or, or yeah. meeting people where they're at to Stanley, right? Like if somebody doesn't cook, I'm not going to force them to cook. Which can be like go right. find stuff that that meets your needs. I guess like it, it's also important to just have that basic knowledge of uh, um, what's going on into your, what's going into your body or uh, what are you putting into your system. I guess. And yeah. This presentation yeah. really uh, cleared it up a lot. Thank you, thank you. And like we said before too, recognizing patterns. Like one day might not make or break you, but if three days, you know, three times a day mm -hmm. with your meals and over the course of a week, twenty one choices that you're making are significantly you know, not necessarily uh, hurting, but maybe not helping your condition, uh, you might want to really think about that. And Stanley, as you, I mean, first of all, Stanley, I love you. Stanley was part of my mental health retreat uh, last year, and I really appreciate everything you brought to the table, but you recognize that these are behaviors that are consistent, that are happening, that have to kind of be, you know, changed. And that's just a hard thing for people who do what they always done. They get what they always got type of thing. So relearning some of those behaviors, I think, is a part of that discussion, too. Yes. Definitely. definitely. Thank chime, you. Yeah, go ahead, Pessy, chime in. Yes, and I just wanted to bring up that part of what Dina offers in her counseling session is cognitive behavior therapy to help people, you know, incorporate new habits and make those changes. Right. It really feels like, Stanley, sometimes just knowing about food isn't enough. You really have to come from a psychological standpoint of it. Um, but I'm happy to share, and you know, I'll actually make a note of that. I'm happy to share some maybe links to some of the things that might be quick and easy uh, sample meal plans or seven day shopping list or something like that. I'm sure we have something like that in our bank or we'll come across something um, and be able to add that to the post webinar email that's going out. I'm going to make a note of that. So thank you for asking that. And, you know, somebody like Stanley too, that's part of what's called an interprofessional team. You have everybody kind of helping you out a little bit. So you have your doctor doing the labs and talking to you about clinical conditions. You have your dietitian who's helping you with engaging more helpful behaviors. And then maybe you have a mindset coach also, or somebody who's helping you in the licensed clinical social working or a behavioral therapist that's really helping you target any of those triggers and those mindsets that you have to break free from or want to improve prove on. Thanks, Stanley. Anyone else questions or comments with a couple of minutes to spare? Yeah, Cassandra. Hi, welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, I recently found out that um, um, I don't know if we could use the word diagnosed for pre-diabetes. Mm -hmm. I never had this problem before, but I do have a grandmother who's a diabetic and I had a late uncle who got diabetes you know later on in his stage of life mm -hmm. 
Um, my one of the well, a question I would like to ask: When you're looking at the calorie content, mm -hmm. what is what would you say is like too much? Because I've started to do a bit of comparing. So like, for instance, if you wanted to look at so like a vegetarian sausages or sausages, like Frank's, you have some that you might find like 45, then some is 80, and then some might be a bit higher. Right. Um, would you be able to recommend or to give me an idea what range, you know, or what I should not like go over in a day? Because my issue, one of my challenges is because I haven't been in a gym for a while. And mm -hmm. last year, of course, everything went here where, and then I had a situation that I was dealing with. So I was dealing with stress and, you know, I start picking back up some bad eating habits also, but, but exercising was a major factor for me. And I believe that helped me throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm getting older. I'm 45 years old, maybe mm -hmm. 46 this year. So what would you say is like too much in a day, you know, when looking at calorie content? Well, it's again, it's funny that any of these questions, I'm always going to start with, it depends. I really don't place too much weight on calories per se. It depends on how much you're moving around based on your height and weight, your current physical activity. We usually, I, I think as a general rule, especially for women, because uh, those who are menstruating, we don't want you under eating because that can definitely throw off hormones. So without mm -hmm. knowing your personal uh, kind of like, you know, your personal day in the life of you, we would never recommend anything too low. And by too low, I mean, probably anywhere between 12 and 1400 calories to me would be too low. So it's really more about the combination of calories, much like Pessy mentioned, I think in that slide with the meal planning and the meal timing of stuff, we usually mm -hmm. gauge about hundred calories per hour would give us enough energy to move on to the next thing. So Cassandra, okay. I might ask you, if you're looking at, you know, what, uh, what the content is, because a lot of times people will say, eat low cal foods or don't eat anything more than hundred calories or something like that, or the lower mm -hmm. calorie, the better, but that's mm -hmm. not often the case. So if you're creating for yourself a breakfast at seven or seven 30 AM, you mm -hmm. might want something heartier. You might want a three or 400 or even a 500 calorie meal, because maybe mm -hmm. your next meal is not going to be until 12. So you okay. want something that you can eat and fill up on. The other thing too, as we shared with that macronutrients discussion, and I realize we're going over a couple of minutes. So I hope if anybody else wants to stick around, I'm fine with sticking around, but not all calories are created equally. We have different calories per gram of different macronutrients, things keep you fuller and longer. So again, if you're looking at that, that nutrition label and you're seeing, you know, uh, whatever, 200 calories on this particular food item, but the breakdown of macronutrients is mostly dense in, in carbs and not really representative in proteins and fats. That's going to mm -hmm. go through, that's going to go through you in a couple hours. You're going to be hungry again in a couple of hours, no matter how many calories that is. So you oh. want to create that combination nation of fullness and a variety of different macros. So again, as an example, right? So if I have, a, uh, if I have a typical breakfast meal for America would be like cereal or oatmeal, that's mm -hmm. just, that's just a carbohydrate. That's a grain product that, that oats are a grain, even if it has fiber in it, it's just a mm -hmm. grain. And maybe mm -hmm. if I use the packets, it's like 150 or 200 calories. Maybe if I make it with water or versus milk, I add a little bit more calories there, but I might mm -hmm. say stir in some peanut butter in there or add some nuts to it because now you've mm -hmm. boosted up the protein and the fat content. And now okay. that, that becomes 200, it goes to 300 calories and you feel significantly fuller. So you're not going to be wanting to pick, but also your blood sugar will remain a little bit more stable before your next meal goes. And so, uh, there are, I mean, I probably won't be able to share this in the post webinar email, because, um, this is something that I just get a little concerned about not knowing individual discussions, but there are things online that you can look up calories that you can um, calculate for yourself of how many calories I should be eating at my current height and weight. But again, I really feel like it's based on what your needs are. If you're mm -hmm. physically active, you might need more calories on a particular day mm -hmm. than on days that you're more sedentary, but I never want anybody going too low where you're like, you know, starving yourself and your blood sugar is going all over the place. Does that make sense? Cassandra? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, well, at this point, I'm not as active as before, but I started to get up and go walking on mornings. Yeah. So, so like 45 minutes or sometimes even longer. Um, so far, maybe four days a week, 
right. hopefully that would increase. I did gain a lot of weight, 190 pounds. So I was freaking, I'm only 5'4". Mm-hmm. So, so I was like, yes, definitely that I, I needed to do something about it. And right. then I got my physical done and I got the result afterwards because I was being tired on the third day and out of it also too. So yeah. I recognized that yeah, something definitely had to be up. So it does make sense. The days that I'm stationary. Mm-hmm. And I think one of my issues, sorry, not to take up all your time. That's okay. But I think one of my issues also is that eating at a particular time so I might not mm-hmm. eat breakfast that early but right. maybe later because I'm home at this point so then the next second meal up might come later on in the day which makes it even worse and then I'm trying to study right. um, during a course so then like if I'm up late during the night like one o'clock two o'clock in the morning trying to get assignments done right I t- I'm fine I'm tempted to snack on something mm-hmm. to help keep me away. So those right. are some of the challenges that I have encountered. You're, you're reminding me of a couple of things I wanted to add. So for in the case of what you were saying too, with the weight gain and managing a healthy weight for yourself, whether whatever your goal is, again, you don't want to feed the person you want to become. You still want to feed the person you are now, but you want to mm-hmm. be a little bit more mindful of how you are taking in those calories. So like I said before, with kind of, you know, making sure you're combining a variety of different things to help support support your hunger, your blood sugar, and your energy levels. And you mentioned the thing too about timing of stuff also. I mean, there's no real hard, fast rule. I've seen a lot of times people say like, don't eat past seven o'clock at night. It's whenever, you you know, when are you going to bed? If you eat your dinner at 5 PM, but you don't go to sleep until midnight, you probably need another, another (laughs) snack or something. But I think what my recommendation would be is Uh, And what I hear from you too, is don't let your heaviest meal be Mm -hmm. close to the end of your day because you're not, yeah, you're not really using that energy up. It's going to maybe also affect your sleeping quality and quantity at the end of the day too. So it really does help to front load, front load your calories. So if I were to give you some sort of guidance, I would probably say 500 calories, 200 snack, 500 calories meal, 200 snack, 500 calories meal offsetting in some way. What does that add up to? 1700 calories? I can't, I can't do math. What is 15, 1700 calories or 1800 calories. So, you know, as a guideline, depending on standards of what you see on nutrition facts labeled America, they usually set like a 2000 calorie diet, but everybody's Mm -hmm. different. So you can use that as a gauge, maybe four to 500 calories. First, first meal, whatever Mm -hmm. you consider that to be, it doesn't have to be breakfast at 6 AM. It could be whatever your first meal is. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, every few hours that you feel a little hungry, if you really are spanning the day from first thing in the morning until midnight, when you're eating, when when you're uh, studying, you Mm -hmm. might have to chip away at some of those things. So maybe your last meal is like 300 calories or 200 calories towards the end of the night, just to make sure you're filling yourself up to have that energy, that brain power to continue studying without throwing off your sleep too late Mm -hmm. in the evening. Okay. Understood. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's funny that we don't come with owner's manuals. This is the problem with humans. We have to figure out as we go, we hear things from people, we get very confused. And I think again, coming from the point of the dietitian standpoint of understanding and recognizing nutrition, but also how everybody's different, right? I'm an early bird. You stay, I, I, I'm asleep for four hours by the time you're still working on your homework assignments. <laughs> so it's all very different of how we, how we have to kind of create our own way of doing things. And same thing, like what Stanley asked you before, I don't know if there's a pat answer that I could give out. Um, but there might be some resources that I can share in, um, when I do the post email to everybody. So stay tuned for that. And I'm happy, I'm happy to share some other things. Thanks so much for your question, Cassandra. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Yeah, very I don't much. mind. Please. I don't mind staying on another minute or so. If anybody else has any other questions before we officially wrap up. Thank you. Have a Thank good you. afternoon. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Pessy, anything else for you to add? Any, any comments, questions, or feedback on your end that you're thinking of? Not, again, not to put you on the spot, but I don't want to leave you hanging there on your own. Yes, no, just thank you all for, for being here. And I would love to hear any feedback that you may have. And when Dina sends out that post survey, you can put it in there. 
Yes, exactly. Thanks everybody so much for attending. And thank you again, Pessy, for helping put in this all together. Uh, it's been a true joy. Pessy and I, just as a side note, have been together for four weeks now. And this is actually our last week officially together as intern and preceptor. But as is the case with all of you who know me already, you're part of my family. No matter where we are, we're always going to be in each other's lives. So thanks everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Eat well and be well. And I will stop the recording now and just keep an eye out for our emails coming in a couple of days. Thanks everybody.